Inshallah, today we'll have a short khatira, introduce you to one of the main uh, famous figures of early Islam. Uh, and he is one of the ascetics that is known in the books of history. And his name is Malik ibn Dinar. And his story is a beautiful story and there are certain benefits and fawaid we can derive from it. Who is Malik ibn Dinar? Malik ibn Dinar is a tabi'i. He's not a sahabi, he's a tabi'i. He was born in the era of the sahaba and he studied under some of the sahaba. It is said that maybe even he saw Ibn Abbas as a child, but he studied with Anas ibn Malik. And he studied with the senior uh, tabi'un of Basra and he became a middle level tabi'un. Tabi'un are de themselves levels depending on their era. So you have the great era of the tabi'un like Hassan al-Basri. Then you have the next generation like Malik ibn Dinar. So this is Malik ibn Dinar. After the death of al-Hassan al-Basri, the famous you know, uh, scholar of Basra, Malik ibn Dinar became the main icon of religiosity, of zuhd, of asceticism. And he was known for not only ilm, but primarily for ibadah, for worship. He was an icon of the city in terms of his lifestyle, very simple, very frugal, in terms of constant worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always being in the masjid. Anybody wanted to see him, he would go to the masjid, find him there. He once famously remarked, had it not been for the fact that I have to break my wudu and do wudu outside, I would be sitting here day and night. He would want to stay in the masjid. And there are many beautiful anecdotes about him. Uh, you can look up in any book I'll just mention some of them once it is narrated that uh, a thief came and uh, broke into the house of uh, Malik ibn Dinar and he was in the corner doing dhikr and the thief did not notice and he scoured the house he couldn't find anything to steal there was nothing to steal in the house of Malik ibn Dinar so then Malik saw and said to him you didn't find anything of this dunya can I gift you something better so the thief became shocked and he became embarrassed what is it what can you give me better than this? He said, do wudu and stand with me in tahajjud. So the thief felt so shy. He did wudu, prayed tahajjud. The adhan of fajr was called and Malik ibn Dinar went to pray fajr with the thief. Somebody was shocked. He saw him, who is this guest? You never have any guests. Who is this person with you? Malik ibn Dinar said, this was a person who came to steal something from us. But we ended up stealing from him, meaning his bad akhlaq. We stole it from him, and now we are going to Salat al-Fajr. Malik ibn Dinar as well, he was a person who earned his livelihood. His rizq was by writing the Qur'an. He would write the Qur'an, and in those days, you know, the, the Qur'an had to be written down. And then, you know, obviously, uh, sell the Qur'an, the copy that he had written, and he would then live off of that. It would take him four months to write one mushaf. Four months to write one mushaf. And then as soon as somebody purchased the mushaf, he would take that money and he would immediately go to the grocery store, not even take it home, and leave it as a deposit so that he could just purchase food and he didn't have to touch money. So the grocery store had a credit with him. Based on the money, he would come. Every once in a while, the money would come in. Pause here, footnote. The Prophet wasallam said that the uh, subject or the profession that has the most right that you pay for it is the Qur'an. Hadith is in Bukhari. And some people think, oh, I, how can I pay for the Qur'an? You're paying for the Qur'an teacher or you're paying for somebody writing the Qur'an. Our Prophet ﷺ said, if you're going to pay something for anything, the most blessed thing to pay for is the Qur'an. By this hadith, our scholars derived that the Prophet ﷺ opened the door for getting a payment for that which might be religion. You keep your niyyah sincere for the sake of Allah. But if you're going to get paid, then the best thing to get paid for is the Qur'an. This is a hadith. So we pay our Qur'an teachers and we pay people who write the Qur'an and we buy the Qur'an from the, you know, mushaf from the people. All of this is completely jaiz. So Malik ibn Dinar would earn his livelihood by writing the Qur'an. He considered this to be the most noble livelihood. And as I said, he would not even keep the money at home the thief would come there's nothing there's nothing there uh, once the Umayyads appointed a governor for Mal for Basra he was from Basra right once the Umayyads appointed the governor and the governor walked in with fine garments boasting his chest puffed out walking like this through the streets and Malik ibn Dinar saw him and said do you not fear Allah this type of bo boastful walking is not allowed in Islam unless you are on the battlefield and you have to show the enemy. In that case, yes, you walk like that. Otherwise, you do not puff your chest and walk like this. So this uh, Umayyad prince became insulted. He said, do you not know who I am? Do you not know who I am? And Malik ibn Dinar said, yes, wallahi, I know who you are. You are a creature who was created from a fluid that is despicable even to mention. 
and your end result is going to be a corpse that is so stenchful nobody will want to smell it or see it and in the middle you are a sack carrying your own defecation that's who you are now what are you going to do about that literally say yeah i know exactly who you are your beginning is something embarrassing to talk about your end is disgusting nobody wants to see it and in the middle you are carrying your own what you're going to go to the toilet in other words when somebody tried to be arrogant by his wealth by his prestige and pride malik put him in his place like who do you think you are we are all banu adam we are all created beings now there are many interesting stories and many beautiful things about you know malik ibn dinar but the main key point i wanted to bring up is that malik ibn dinar was not like this for his whole life no he was not like this for his whole life. He actually had a very non-religious beginning. He was a member of the paramilitary elite of the government. You know, they had, you would call them the secret service, okay? So when the government didn't like somebody, they would send the secret service to arrest, rough them up, maybe even kill them. You know that, you know, we all have them in our countries back home. You know what I'm talking about. He was of that group of people. And these are considered, and they are still considered the worst of the worst. Everybody despises them. They have sold their deen and dunya for the sake of money. They have sold their izza for the sake of a paycheck, right? This is the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low. And he grew up as a young man. He was of that group of people. And he would drink constantly. He was a drunkard. He would drink as a young man. And... Allah blessed him with a child, a daughter. And he loved this daughter immensely. Uh, the daughter passed away at the age of two. The daughter passed away. The dying of the daughter, the death of the daughter, triggered him into depression and drinking more. That's what usually happens when you don't have iman, right? The depression that he went into, he became a complete drunkard. And one night, he was drinking and he fell asleep and he didn't even pray Isha. Back then, even the drunkards prayed a little bit. Yeah, there was different hero back then, right? So in his drunken stupor, he didn't even pray Salat al-Isha. And he went to sleep. In the dream, he had a dream that night. And this is the story of him flipping over. In the dream, he saw that he was in front of a massive furnace. And the furnace became hotter and hotter. And the fire became unbearable. So he turned around and he began to flee. But wherever he ran, the furnace was right behind him. He couldn't run away. Wherever he's running, the furnace is right there. Then he saw a man in the dream. Very beautiful, handsome, very impeccable clothes. And he thought, this man can save me. So he said to the man, oh man, you seem like Rajul Saleh, a good man. Save me from this furnace. The man said, I am too weak. I cannot save you. And in the dream, then he's going and he sees his two-year-old daughter. Two-year-old daughter. And the daughter recites to him a verse of the Quran. أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Hasn't the time come for the people of Iman that their hearts soften towards the remembrance of Allah? Isn't it enough now? خلاص. Now hasn't the time come that your heart becomes soft? And he said, Ya binti, you know the Qur'an? She said, yes, we know it in this world better than you. Yes, we know it. So she said, Ya binti, my daughter, what is, explain to me what is happening. What is this fire? What is this man? So the daughter says, that fire, it is your sins. And it is going to engulf you. It is your sins. That good man, it is the small amount of good deeds you've done, which is not strong enough yet to save you from your own fire. You haven't made this man strong enough. Your good deeds, they are too weak to save you from this fire. So he woke up and right then and there, he broke all of the bottles of wine in his house and he turned over and you leave. He quit this evil profession he was in and this was the, uh, uh, the, the flip that happened to him that he turned over completely, dedicated the rest of his life to ibadah and zuhd and taqwa and spreading ilm. He has a number of hadith as well in the famous sixth book. Even Al-Bukhari mentions his name in his famous sahih and this shows us so many things and of the most beautiful lessons and we have so many lessons like this that Allah Azza wa Jal judges people by their ending, not their beginning. And we should not lose hope, even if we might be at a phase of our lives where we're not living our best. SubhanAllah, there's always time to change. Doesn't matter how we are today, as long as we're aiming to be better tomorrow, and we put in the effort. So this is a person who grew up as a young man, a drunkard, grew up doing the worst profession possible. And then SubhanAllah, a flip happened. And it is also shows us that sometimes, in fact, usually, 
If we have Iman, a calamity is a blessing in disguise. A calamity becomes a blessing in disguise. If we have Iman, something that is so painful, it is used as a catalyst to bring about a blessing. And in fact, the loss of his daughter was eventually what triggered him to become a better Muslim and the most pious Muslim of, in fact, you know, it is said of the city of Basra of his generation. He died in the year 127 Hijrah. So early on, 127 Hijrah. And it is said, these are legends that are said, Allah knows best. When I say legends, I mean... We find it in some books of history. We would not know for sure, certain. It is said that towards the end of his life, he was of the first people. You know, the uh, conquest of Sindh had begun at that time, the conquest of India. So it is said that he was of the first people to go and start preaching Islam in India. And to this day, there is a small village, you know, in the southern coast of India. There is a masjid of Malik ibn Dinar. And the legends, the people firmly believe, the people will swear to you, that this is the qabr of Malik ibn Dinar. And we find this mentioned in some of the books of the past that he was of the first batches of people to go and preach Islam in India and to this day there is a qabr in this I don't know the name of the village uh, uh, in the southern coast of India uh, and it is said as I said there's a qabr and his masjid there and the people of that village and town they say that the first person to spread Islam in our community and we have been Muslim this is by the way the, uh, the uh, Kerala community in South India right so there's two places of, of Indian Islam there's northern and, and that's where Muhammad ibn Qasim came and that was you know the different and then you have southern Islam southern Indian Islam that's the Kerala uh, and, and uh, Malayalam and other states there and in those regions there was no Muhammad ibn Qasim in those regions there was no army it was people that came and preached and taught Islam. And it is said that Malik ibn Dinar was of the first to go and preach Islam. And as we know, the entire southern coast has, uh, uh, are Muslim because of people like Malik ibn Dinar. This is the story of Malik ibn Dinar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resurrect us with the righteous of the past. We ask Allah to allow us to benefit from these stories. We ask Allah azza wa jal to make us righteous and to overcome our sins and to make our ibrah, our final days, the best days and our final deeds, the best deeds. And we ask Allah that we all I'll die upon Tawheed and Ikhlas and the Kalima and Ishal will continue later. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.